Before I start, take a look around. Isn't this an amazing venue? Like this is an amazing theater. So please, a huge round of applause and thanks to the DOT scale team, because this is one of the best conferences I've ever been to. So. Computation is about functions. Functions are encoded, and code is data. So computation is about data. And how data moves, how it transfers in the network, what properties it has, how fault tolerant that system is, has vast implications into what our computation can do, what our software does, what our applications do, and therefore what we as humans are capable of doing. Software has already become our superpower. We can do amazing things today that 30 years ago were absurd. And this is because of our computation platform. And thus, how we move that computation really matters in a very deep, ethical way. And I'm here to talk to you about that. And uh, there's a lot of problems, right, that it makes sense to talk to you, the engineers and developers and designers of the web the architects that are constructing how this network operates. Uh, there are problems that you need to be aware of, uh, solutions that you may employ to fix them. And I want to tell you about one possible solution that we're working on, and that's IPFS, the Interplanetary File System. So in the days of yore, there was packet switching, right? This is uh, Paul Baran's classification of networks. Um, from centralized to decentralized to distributed. And these have very different properties, right? So centralized networks are very easy to take down, but they're very easy to, to work with, right? Like it's, it's very simple to up, upgrade the thing and so on. Distributed networks are much more fault tolerant, but way harder to build. The internet is this amazing nervous system that we all share, and we can ship around our computations and our data to each other, and it has made it possible for me to speak to you around the world in less than a second. It's incredible. And the web is truly how we humans use the internet. We, we don't speak you know, encoded byte streams, so we have to use applications on top of the internet. And these applications that today govern most of our lives, there's deep implications about how the web is structured that changes how these applications behave and how our superpowers uh, work. And so the web is sick. Uh, it's sick with centralization. This is a disease. This you know, it started kind of simple. You know, you have one nice server serving a bunch of clients, but you know, then it looks something like this, and then suddenly it gets. You know, this is only like a small picture. You can think of one massive web server serving billions of users, right? And in reality, we all know that that one web server is a massive distributed system behind the scenes. But it all goes to this one choke point, which means that you, your clients, your mobile phones, and so on, have to talk to the backbone. Uh, and, and so this has deep implications with, with how we use the network, right? So first off, you know, it's obviously terribly inefficient, right? When you, if you all loaded Gangnam Style right now and had to download the same video, uh, you'd peg the, the bandwidth of the entire uplink from here uh, to there, and we'd waste an enormous amount of bandwidth, right? Uh, why can't we be more efficient about this? You know, Gangnam Style has been viewed 2.5 billion times, and if you, you know, take the, the average size video to be 200 megs, uh, that's roughly 512 petabytes. Like, this is totally back of the envelope, probably not right, but this gives you a scale of the, of the magnitude um, of the, the bandwidth that we're talking about, right? Uh, the web is basically not in, in very much in mobile and less so in, in all the IoT stuff, right? It's vanishing from, from those platforms. And because the architecture just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to have to talk to a centralized server all the time. It doesn't work offline. It doesn't work in disconnected networks. Uh, think about my supercomputer, right, in, in this pocket. This thing is incredibly powerful, and why can't I send a message from here to your computer right there? Like, it's just, I just want the message from here to go to there. And this doesn't work today. It doesn't work very efficiently. And most of these applications force you to mediate all the transfers through the backbone. Uh, it also has a terrible security model, in my point of view. Uh, aside from the massive breaches and the mass surveillance and so on, there's like a deeper problem, which is that even if we force everyone to encrypt with TLS, the data itself is not encrypted at rest. Or it's not even authenticated, right? So you could have your email or all your social networking information, and somebody on the server side could sneak in there and change it, and you would, wouldn't even know. Suddenly you, you could find old emails that you wrote, theoretically, uh, without you know, any kind of signature. 
Like we've known about encryption and digital signing for many decades. We should know better. We should be doing, working with these primitives in a much better way. Um, so I'd love to get uh, the web to be authenticated and encrypted at rest. Uh, there's also a point about data control, right? And I think uh, here Europe is way far ahead uh, than the US in thinking about this, but uh, you know, there's these massive social networks that are gathering a lot of data and making it possible for me to send a message to the world and for anyone in the world to send a message back to me. And that's incredibly powerful and, and, and amazing. Uh, but these databases are not really ours, right? They're, they're governed by these applications and the addresses themselves to the resources always go through them, right? So if I wanna link you to a tweet, I have to link you through the application that they govern. There's no way of, of linking you to the data itself. Uh, this is particularly infuriating. So the, the internet is this amazing force for equality, right? Like it, it gives people equal access to knowledge, equal access to communication and so on. And the web was like that for, for, for a while. Uh, but nowadays with websites being megabytes in size, or you know, web servers cutting off connections that have too bad latencies, right? It happened to me. In, if your latency goes above six or seven seconds, a lot of web servers will just not even talk to you. Uh, you won't even complete TLS handshakes. So that is a disaster because we're, we're blocking the people that need the web the most. Uh, and that is, in my point of view, inexcusable and we need to fix this. Uh, and even here in the nice metropolises with, with fountains of data and so on, um, natural disasters can occur. And so what happens when a network has no or bad connectivity to the backbone, but the local network still works? You know, in many cases, you can still get reliable connectivity in one area or you can deploy a mesh network, but the, the uplink may be off. So why is it that we can't make our communication systems operate in situations like these, right? Like what happens today is like, oh, sorry, error, try again later, right? Like imagine that you're trying to find your family, right? Um, and it gets worse when it's about human disasters, right? So when suddenly, um, you know, there's massive censorship or surprise suppression, one morning you wake up and uh, your access to the internet is off. Uh, you can't talk to anyone. Like that is not okay. So the last thing I'll mention is that links break and that sites disappear because this idealized web of documents is really a web of documents on specific machines. And this is like a book burner's paradise because all you have to do is go and take one server down. Or worse, we just carelessly change URLs all the time. We don't even think about it. We just break tons of links and people's uh, access breaks at that point. Uh, so hopefully I've, I've impressed upon you the, the weight of the matter here. Uh, these are serious issues that our society has to deal with. And they don't enter our field of view most of the time, right? Because you're just focused very much on, on your application and getting to the next thing and, uh, and building the next cool feature and, and deploying it and so on. And after all, you know, it's not your threat model to, to deal with situations like that. Um, but whether or not it is, it is your, your model, people are using your applications and they're depending on them. The, the get amazing superpower that you gave them with this beautiful piece of software, uh, they start depending on that superpower and at any point when that superpower doesn't quite work right or breaks or you, know, you move on and stop maintaining it, uh, that is a breaking a social contract that was implicit in, in the giving of the software. All right, so a lot of these problems are stem from the addressing model. So when you think about uh, the web and, and how you point at all of the content, you always point in terms of domain names or IP addresses. So it's about location, names and location. And you have to be online to resolve all of this. Uh, it's a little bit like, imagine if I told you to go read a book, but my directions for reading the book started with, hey, go to this specific library in a specific location, uh, you know, go and find this book there. And you couldn't go anywhere else to find the book. That's kind of you know, crazy, right? And it made a lot of sense at the time. It made the web scalable. But now um, we are in this bad situation where this is a, a very strong force for centralization and it makes it very difficult for us to build decentralized or distributed alternatives. Uh, you know, it looks like this. Even if a ton of people had the, had the content, you, only one specific host can serve it to you. So there's good news, right? Like the good news is that the hard part of the internet, uh, of building the internet is over, right? We, we wired up a lot of the, the world. There's still much more to go, but at the very least we have this amazing platform that we can deploy software updates to. And all it takes is new protocols and new code to fix things. And applications themselves are relatively easy to fix. 
Uh, and so you, one of the things I want to impress upon you is that you can fix this. You have the power to do this. Uh, it's kind of daunting to think changing the entire internet, right? But all you need is just um, to think about like good ideas and turn those into specs and turn, create some implementations and deploy them. And if they're good, you'll grant humans more superpowers. It's the same thing that you do with an application, but you could do it at the internet level. And this you know, goes from like, you know, research, development, deployment, and so on. And a lot of these problems have been fixed in the past. It's just that the pipeline from research to usage is really bad. Uh, most of the research does, never gets used. Uh, and we need to fix this as well. This is another problem. I'll talk about Git for a little bit, and then I'll dive into IPFS, because uh, you know, I, I wanted to impress upon you the magnitude of the problems, because that's really what IPFS is about. It's solving those things. Um, that's far more important for you to understand than, than the technical details. But let's dive in. So uh, we all you know, understand Git to, to a good degree. You know, in the good old days of, of CVS and SVN, we had a centralized server, and we had to talk to this one machine. And if you got disconnected from it, you couldn't work. And if that thing went down, nobody could work, right? Um, Git came in and solved that problem by saying, no, 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 this is madness. Let's do distributed ver version control, um, have the ability to have many, many servers, many clients able to talk to each other. If you get disconnected, it doesn't matter. You can still work individually. You can still talk to others. If, you know, honey badger don't care. Uh, if, uh, if the central things fall apart, still doesn't matter. Honey badger don't care. You can still work. You can talk to each other. You can set up a new one, and it's not a big problem, right? It's annoying, but it's not a big problem. So IPFS is about taking this type of approach and making it work across the entire web. It's what I like to call hyperspeed because it allows you to cheat the speed of light. You might have the content locally. And, and the whole point here, like, the reason Git is able to do this is because it Merkle links objects. One object is linked to another through its cryptographic hash. And that makes it so that anyone can serve it to you and that you can check the integrity. You can think of like this chain of documents of, of being able to verify all of these links, right? Uh, another amazing development is CRDTs, conflict-free re replicated data types. This is an amazing development. Uh, not enough time to cover it here, but I wanted to point it out because if you don't know about these, go find out. Huge deal. Uh, it's still early days, but these are going to change how we build all applications. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is the explosion of a uh, like new wave of peer-to-peer 2.0 type protocols that are coming, right? So it's all started with Bitcoin and reminding us that we could build distributed systems, reminding us that we can, that we can do transactions in a different way, that we can cede control to the network and then behave uh, as part of it. Uh, Ethereum took that and took it up a notch by being able to just do any kind of computation through it. Uh, and now we're starting to see the first large applications being deployed on top of these networks, right? So Things like OpenBazaar, which uh, launched recently, that's a full eBay-like store system where you can sell anything that works completely distributed and decentralized, uses Bitcoin as a payment system, and all of the content is accessible through the network, and there's no central point. You can add central points to improve the performance, right, to optimize, but never as a point of control or failure. And that's the point, right? So if we were to categorize the web in, you know, 1.0 world, uh, we just took the internet and we added the ability to point at, at data. In Web 2.0, we pointed at programs and had those programs run and manipulate the data. And what, if I were to call this thing Web 3.0, it's, it's an inversion of, of the relationship where now data links to data itself or programs and they operate with public verifiability so that no organization, no entity can manipulate those results or that you, you don't depend on people. It's like massive disintermediation. Uh, so maybe we can use these ideas to structure a better web, to link the web in a stronger way, um, and to improve our, our system, right? Let's make the web faster, safer, operate in a distributed way, uh, have permanent links, uh, and work offline. And so that's what IPFS is about. It's about creating a new hypermedia distribution protocol. Really just, that means, you know, a fancy way of saying just a new transport for the web that uses Merkle links as, as its core idea. This is kind of like the stack of the protocol. Uh, it's break, broken up into different pieces. Like the bottom part, which is the hardest thing to do, is build all this like peer-to-peer -peer software. You know, tons of different protocols that you have to think about and, and use. You know, being able to connect locally, being able to deal with DHTs, being able to deal with PubSub and, and so on. All these different kind of transports, being able to be inside of a browser contain, uh, you know, browser sandbox and talk to the rest of the network, all that kind of stuff. That is probably the hardest part, but, um, and we're creating this, uh, library around it, so you'll be able to build all sorts of peer-to-peer -peer systems out of it. 
so when you think about IPFS, you really think of like a bunch of peer-to-peer -peer protocols inside of this one node and some really nice interfaces to just add and retrieve content by hash. And so this, this core part of IPFS, it's the web of Merkle links. And so think about structuring data. Um, in, you know, it has the same kind of properties as Git, Bitcoin, and BitTorrent, and so on. Um, and you think of IPFS as this huge Merkle forest, right? So if, if individual trees of Merkle linked are, are one tree, you, know, you can think of like blockchains as this massively tall tree, and you should be able to link between all the things. Naming applications and so on, layer on top. And so the addressing model looks like this, where at the bottom you, bottom you have content addresses uh, pointing to, those are immutable and uh, you know, get changed whenever you manipulate the content, but those are dependable forever. Right? You don't have to be around, servers don't have to be around, those are truly dependable. The next layer is naming with keys. Uh, there's a bunch of interesting stuff around that, but uh, won't have time to cover it. And then there's names uh, on top that you can bind. Human readable names should be bound at the very top at the end, not as the core part that you depend on. Uh, so when you think about adding content to IPFS, you can think of a file system, and that just maps directly into you know, this, the way that Git does it with uh, just doing uh, Merkle linking, right? Like you just hash contents and take that hash and put it as a link in the, the other file and you keep going all the way to the root. So you have the ability to address and path nicely as you would expect in the web or, or the file system. Uh, you can do more complicated stuff like versioning data structures, right? It doesn't have to be a file. Like IPFS is not about files. Even though it's a file system, it's about data and structuring relationships between data. So think about just a, a git commit and like applying git commits to anything, not just files. You could ver git commit version um, of you know, like your edits to a song or something. Uh, and, and so you think about just accessing IPFS data through, through an interface like that. And so you, you take the data model that is right now locked up in your databases and just rip it open and spread it into the web. And like that is what we can do. It's, you can address all the content directly. You don't have to depend on those organizations. You don't have to depend on those particular pieces of software. Um, you can move around, you can reason about how the content moves, how the syncs happen, and so on to make offline possible. You can do things like have the whole PKI, like all the certificate authority stuff, like all the certificates and so on, put them straight on IPFS, and all you need is one hash. And from one hash, you can retrieve signatures, certificates, keys to validate stuff, and so on. It's about giving information uh, print-like qualities where the references are to the work and not to the copy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is the, the IPFS stack. It's about that central po point, how we represent data, and, and so on. And it's a huge open source project. It has got tons of contributors. It's very high velocity. So uh, this is really a call to you to come and help us and help build it, uh, because how we lay out this foundation now can have vast implications for you in the future, and it would be fantastic to get your input now. Huge network, you know, you know, a bunch of like interesting things. Here's the kind of stuff that people build, uh, you know, distribution platforms, peer-to-peer -peer chat, archives, all, you know, totally distributed web apps. Um, you can find all of this stuff on the web. I don't really have to go through it here, uh, but you can just know that you can build things like distributed chat applications entirely in IPFS. Like this is one example. Just you type, enter stuff, each individual message is an object that you can address. Uh, you can create new interfaces to access the same data, it doesn't matter. You can use it for package managers, so you know, when you think about package managers being centralized and so on, and that being a problem, uh, you can think of putting NPM on IPFS or a Go package manager. Uh, so we have, all of these are pro uh, projects that we have, uh, you should check out. All right, so that's really all I want to say about IPFS and about the network, and if I would end with one word, is that think carefully about the implications of the software you create. Because whether you want it or not, people depend on the software you write and depend on the failure modes that you create. And so when you give somebody this amazing superpower and make it really good and they start using it and depending on it, you will have to deal with that social contract you created. And if you break that, um, bad things can happen. And so thank you. That's it.